you. I miss seeing all of your faces. Um, so I'm looking forward to the day when we can be reunited and have dinner together again and some of some baked potatoes and Diane and Alan's macaroni cheese. Um, I'm here really just to, to share some things that um, God's been speaking to me about. Um, we've been asked this week to focus a little bit on prayer. Um, and I don't know if you're anything like me, I find prayer really hard work. I find it um, a lot, it's quite a lot of effort sometimes to even feel motivated to pray, um, to feel like I ha have the words to pray. Um, so the verse of scripture that we're focusing on, on is in Matthew 6. And in this bit of scripture, Jesus is teaching his followers how to pray. And he gives them, you know, the Lord's Prayer, what we know as the Lord's Prayer. Um, and it's a really great structure, a really great way of praying. Um, and it starts with praise. You know, the first thing that Jesus starts with is our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, which basically means holy. You're holy. Your name is holy. Everything about you is holy. So he starts with praising God. Um, and that's certainly a bit of prayer that I find quite hard at times. If things in my life are challenging, if they're not going the way that I would like them to go, if things are just a bit difficult, I find it really hard to praise God. And um, I might come to prayer and feel quite angry or feel quite disappointed about something. And then I think, oh, I really just don't want to praise God. I just really don't want to praise you. Um, when I'm like that, um, there's a, a chapter in the Bible that I often go to. And it's Psalm 145, because it's really just beautiful words about why God is worthy of praise and who he is. Um, I'm going to read it. Um, so what I would just encourage you to do is just to meditate on these words and just to think about them um, and think about um, who God is um, from this scripture. So let me just read Psalm 145. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works. They tell and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might, so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he does. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. Amen. So I don't know if you are like me and sometimes find it hard to praise God. Um, I would encourage you to go to Psalm 145. You can look it up online if you don't have a Bible and just read it. Um, you might want to underline bits, highlight bits and think about what does that mean in your life? You know, what does it mean um, that God satisfies the desire of every living thing? What does it mean that God is trustworthy to you? What does it mean that God is gracious and compassionate? Um, and just think about those things. That's what I do with this scripture when I'm finding it hard to pray and I think about um, who God is and I think about how to praise him.
Have you ever wondered why so many people pray? Well, Albert Einstein said that there's really only two ways to live, as if nothing's a miracle or as if everything's a miracle. Either life's a fluke and we're just a bunch of highly evolved animals on a big rock lost in space, or there's a creator behind creation, a, a god behind goodness. And if so, then connecting with him in prayer is pretty much the most mind-blowing thing you can do. Archaeologists keep digging stuff up that shows we've always prayed. People of many faiths pray daily. Even atheists admit to praying sometimes. Real prayer is a two-way conversation with the living God who loves and listens to the things we say. Jesus said, ask anything in my name and it'll be done. We have a chance to ask for peace, healing, help or whatever we need. Life matters, you matter, your choices, thoughts, prayers and actions echo in eternity. But in case you hadn't noticed, God is pretty much invisible and not always easy to hear. There are distractions, disappointments and questions that we all share. That's why 24-7 prayer does stuff to help thousands of people in hundreds of places connect with God in new ways. People are learning to pray by just praying. Why don't you take on the challenge of a 24-7 prayer room? Just gather your friends, find a place, pick a week, get creative in the space and fill every hour of the week with a chain of prayer. Prayer vigils like these have been changing lives for 2,000 years and today millions are discovering that God's real, life's a miracle and the most powerful thing you can ever do is to pray. When Jesus taught us how to pray, he taught us to say or to pray for his kingdom to come. How do we recognise if God's kingdom has come? Well, I think there are signs of the kingdom. I think if we, where we see love and joy and hope and justice, these are signs of God's kingdom. But what does it mean to pray for those things to come? Well, Jesus told us lots of stories about the kingdom of God. And I just want to pick up on two today. In Matthew 13, Jesus talks about, gives us two stories. He says, the kingdom of God is like yeast. It gets kneaded through dough and the whole loaf rises. And what he meant was that we, as people of the church, are like yeast in our communities. As we go out and about, we carry the kingdom of God. We carry love and joy and hope and justice. We carry these things into our conversations, into our friendships, into our homes and workplaces. These things are things of the kingdom. In the same passage in Matthew, he talks about the kingdom of God being like a mustard seed. He says it's the smallest of all the seeds and yet it grows into a huge tree that's as big that with many branches that all the birds of the air can come and find space to nest in the tree. And that, I think, is about the church being a safe space, a space of sanctuary, a place where love and joy and hope and justice are found that people can come to and take part in and be a part of. And so, as we pray, as Jesus taught us, when we get to your kingdom come, then let's think about how we can be carriers of the kingdom, how we can pray for love and joy and peace and justice and hope and all these good things from God's kingdom, how these things can come and be present in our community. How can we carry God's kingdom into our communities today? Lord, your kingdom come. And there was one prayer I came across in this book of liturgy, which um, 
is really praying for people who are suffering and people who are broken hearted. Um, and we know at this moment in time, there are a lot of people, um, not just in our community in Rukesi, but around Glasgow and around the world who are really suffering, who are really broken hearted, um, who have lost loved ones or who are cut off from loved ones or who are experiencing real disappointment at things in their life that are um, they can't do. And um, I want you to know that it says in scripture, it says in the Bible that um, God is close to the brokenhearted. It, it says that. So if you are someone who is feeling brokenhearted at this moment, just know that God is close to you. And so I want to read this as a prayer um, for people who are um, who are suffering at this moment in time. Um, so let us pray. Let us now in prayer remember and call out to God for those whom the following words of scripture bring to mind. Remember those who tonight will cry, I wish to God it were morning, and come morning will cry, I wish to God it were night. Remember those whose pillows are soaked with tears and whose eyes are tired and dim with weeping. Remember those who, for whatever reason, may want to say, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember those for whom the light that was in them has turned to darkness, and that darkness is doubly dark. Remember those who, in looking to tomorrow, deeply hope that the sick will be healed, the stranger welcomed, the prisoner released, the poor hear good news. And let us in confidence share with God our own hopes and longings. Glory to God our Maker, to God's Son who is Christ our Lord, to the Spirit who dwells in our hearts, both now and forever. Amen. shine